Imam al-Ghazali then, in his teens, extraordinarily precocious scholar already, people already coming to him for guidance and for fatwas. In the morning after Fajr, he meets with a couple of hundred other philosophically minded theologians in the mosque in Nishapur. And the style of argumentation is entirely on the level of akhl. Extremely tense, difficult uh, exchanges on these complex metaphysical, metaphysical questions between the imam and the students. And then after Zohar prayer, he gets on his donkey and he trots out to one of the suburbs of Nishapur and he enters the teaching garden of al farmadi And in true Persian, Central Asian style, Farmadi is teaching in a rose garden, presumably mulberry bushes and, and other flowering shrubs there as well, probably a fountain or some source of water classically Persian scene. And here, he is exposed to a very different type of knowledge. Not the knowledge of the akl or the intellect, but the knowledge of kashf, direct disclosure. Aiming at the state of wilaya, which is the hadith and nawafil, which we looked at yesterday, indicates, comes about through entering progressively more transformative stages of love, mutual love between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the salik, spiritual wayfarer. So Imam al-Ghazali for some years juxtaposes these two traditions, the way of the mind and the way of the heart, two apparently irreconcilable paths to knowledge of Allah. In due course, Imam al-Juwaini dies and as a mark of respect, his students break their pens out of grief and refuse to return to their studies for a full year. Mamul Ghazali realizes that there's nobody who can help him in Nishapur, and so he travels. He leaves Nishapur and he heads for the great intellectual center of the Islamic world at the time, which was the still caliphal capital of Baghdad. <coughs> now, the political conditions prevailing in those days were somewhat disturbing to the Muslim conscience. Inasmuch as a de facto uh, dichotomy had appeared between sacred and profane authority, the hereditary Abbasid Caliph was still there in his comfortable palace in Baghdad, descendant of uh, Harun al-Rashid and Mu'tasim and the great Abbasids of the first Abbasid century, but in fact his role was a largely ceremonial one. He appeared, on, he appeared in state occasions, his name would be recited in the khutbah, would appear on the dinars and the dirhams of the empire, but other than that, really he had very little clout. Real political power was in the hands of sultans. Sultans, uh, this period of Turkish extraction. Now the reason why this happened was that after the initial wave of Arab conquests had subsided, the great warriors in Islamic history, really almost until the present day, were not the Arabs but the Turks. The Abbasids found it expedient to import Turkish slave troops from beyond the frontiers of Islam, the Turks at that time being confined largely to their ancestral homelands in Central Asia, present day Kyrgyzia, Kazakhstan, um, the Uyghur areas, what was until recently known to the Muslims as Turkestan the modern boundaries between Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and those former Soviet republics have no historic validity. They were imposed by the Soviets as a means of reducing the potential lobbying power of Turkestan in the Soviet Empire. So these bodyguards, these toughs, are imported in large numbers and they surround the caliph and protect him and preserve the territorial integrity of the empire. But inevitably they become rather big for their boots, and they established dynasties of their own. We find the Boyid dynasty, one of the first to be established, and by Ghazali's time, the Seljuk Turkish dynasty is well and truly holding the reins of power in the central Islamic world. And the <coughs> Seljuk potentate, who was most significant in Baghdad at the time, was a man called Nizam al-Mulk one of the great names to conjure with in Islamic history, the Wazir Nizam al-Mulk. The Nizam al-Mulk al was 
a great patron of Islamic learning. And for a reason. One of the great problems in governing any Muslim society is dealing with diversity. And we can say that any Muslim state or political theory that cracks this problem basically will have an easy ride. The reason is that Islam as a religion is not constituted in such a way as to allow the ready enforcement of one totalitarian reading of the religion. Christianity, historically, that's always been possible and indeed inevitable. There was a church hierarchy, a magisterium, council of cardinals, and truth was definitively known by the religious elite, the men in purple, and the hierarchy could be mobilized in order to enforce religious and liturgical and doctrinal conformity to the views expressed by the magisterium. So medieval Christendom, particularly Latin Christendom, less so amongst the Orthodox, appears as a largely totalitarian type of religion. And historically, Latin Christendom persecuted dissidents and heretics and unbelievers far more efficiently, systematically, than any other religious civilization has ever done. The most efficient and widespread organization in pre-modern Europe was the Inquisition. Now, in the Islamic context, you can't do that. Because the religion is not constituted sacramentally, there is no hierarchy, there is no automatic authority vested in any supreme leader. And this inevitably means that the community is made up of disparate voices, now as in the past. And certainly by Imam al-Ghazali's day, these disparate voices threatened the very stability of the empire because many of the voices wanted a share of the political cake. So you have to imagine exactly what the city of Baghdad was like and you have to th throw out any images you might have of medieval cities that have been acquired through a study of European history. In medieval London, if you didn't follow the king's religion, you were likely to be uh, burnt at the stake. In medieval Baghdad, virtually every sect and religion on the planet seemed to be there and seemed to be flourishing. Not just Muslim sects, but non-Muslims as well. Every type of Christianity, the Latins were there, the Manichaeans um, were there in Christian and non-Christian varieties. The uh, uh, Jacobite Christians were there, uh, Monophysites of various kinds, Orthodox Chalcedonian Christians were there, Nestorians were there, you name it. They were all present. Various forms of Judaism, including some that are virtually extinct nowadays, like the Karaites, were there in force. In fact, Baghdad was the center of the Jewish world at the time. The, the, the Gaonim, the exilarchs, uh, who were very powerful in the caliphal court, were generally regarded as the, the, the highest authorities in world Judaism at the time. Differences of opinion then between rabbinical and Karaite Judaism. In case you don't know the difference, Karaites are the, if you like, fundamentalists of Judaism who only accept the Torah and don't accept the Talmud. Rabbinical Judaism accepts the Talmud and uh, Tosefta and subsequent um, Jewish writings. And amongst the Muslims, the diversity seemed to be even more conspicuous and to many people, scandalous, and certainly to the politicians, problematic. Because the Mu'tazilites were still very much in business, Indeed, a previous wazir, al Kunduri, had been a strong advocate of the Mu'tazilite cause, a Hanafi Mu'tazili, who um, came down quite hard on, on the Asharis. You had a very strong Hanbali contingent in, in Baghdad, the memory of Ahmed bin Hanbal, uh, still fresh. Uh, this is the world of people like Abu Ya'la, um, Ibn Manda, and uh, a number of distinguished Hanbali, Ahl al-Hadith ulama. You have, of course, a Maliki presence, Qadi Abdul Wahab and the, 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 the Malikis of, of Iraq, still a force to be reckoned with in, in Baghdad. You have uh, the Shia, uh, a whole rainbow of Shia sects, ranging from Jafari Shiism, which was the prevailing religion of the countryside around Baghdad. You have various extreme forms of Shiism, 
lumped together under the name of Ismailism or the Ghulat, the extremists. These are people who don't believe in 12 Imams but believe that uh, there has been an, an unbroken succession of Imams down to the present day and that the Imam of the day is infallible. These people too had a demonstrable political agenda because they had established the Fatimid state, one of the most powerful of Islamic dynasties uh, in Egypt and in Syria and for a brief period also in Tunisia. <coughs> um, nowadays we tend to think of the Ismailis as a rather, well almost as a multinational corporation really, as a kind of money-making enterprise rather than as a powerful religious or political outfit, but in those days it was probably the greatest single threat to the intellectual and political integrity of the Islamic world. The uh, Imam of the Ismailis from his impregnable castle in Alamut sent out missionaries to convert people to Ismailism around the world. When they couldn't convert them they would assassinate them and several senior Seljuks had been assassinated and indeed Nizam al -Mulk himself who became Ghazali's patron was actually assassinated by an Ismaili assassin as he came out of the mosque. Many of you will already know that the English word assassin actually is named after those people. It comes from the Arabic word hashashin or hashish smokers because it was the custom of these assassins to get themselves high on dope in order to gain courage for their suicide missions. That's the origin of the English word assassin. Also in Baghdad, you had a flourishing tradition of religiously very doubtful Arabic philosophy coming from the line of Ibn Sina and Abu Barakat al-Baghdadi. People who, when pressed, would not be able to subscribe to some fundamental Islamic doctrines such as the createdness of the world. So all in all, it was a virtually ungovernable society and no community represented an absolute majority. An inevitable concomitant, one might suggest, of the inherently multivocal nature of Islam. And it's one of the miracles of Islam that from that point onwards, and largely through the work of Imam al-Ghazali and those who followed his agenda, that the more extreme voices have uh, died in the wilderness and that a mainstream maturidi or Ashari Sunnism with the four madhabs has prevailed the way it has done through the great majority of the world of Islam. So this is a hugely important um, pivotal moment in the history of the religion. Would things end in complete fragmentation and uh, the mutual drowning out of, of rival voices? Or could some kind of unity be re-established? 